Um, and for those of you I haven't met as well before, um, the irony of the SIP, set, SIP size sessions is that for the previous four or five weeks, I've actually been delivering these sessions from the Southern Rhone, where I've been doing a harvest. Um, so <laughs> this is, I'm covering the Rhone in my first SIP size from my, uh, from my home home in the UK. So the irony is not lost on me. Last but not least, uh, please do use the chat. I've seen some of you using it already. And if you've got any questions, pop them in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. We've got um, Mahesh behind the scenes handling those. So we should hopefully have time for questions. Fingers crossed. I'm going to do my best. But for those of you who have attended before, you know that I like to talk. And hopefully I'll be able to answer some of the questions as we go along anyway. So let me tell you a little bit about the Rhone and the history of the region, because I think it's really important to understand um, where we're visiting, what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> the Rhone Valley is old. It's old and it is large. So if you take away nothing else this evening, I think that's a good starting point. Um, it's it's formed, uh, or it was formed about 300 million years ago, and it's the result of a geological clash between the Massif Central and the Alps. And it effectively create, um, created a rift valley, sorry, I'm just going to grab water, um, which then was flooded by the Mediterranean. So you actually have a really, really complex geology here. And I'm going to show you some pictures of Mont Bon too later, but um, Mont Bon too, the Dontel Mountains, Dontel Mont Mirai, uh, they are incredibly picturesque, but they're very complex geological formations. So we've got really complex geology here, lots of different soil types. Um, we've also got lots of different altitudes and aspects. And we'll go on to that shortly. We have also got a long, long, long history of winemaking. So uh, the first grapes ever to be grown in France commercially or, or used in the way we imagine viticulture today were um, grown in Marseille. So just down to the south of France and, and effectively the nearest port to this southern Rhone. And about 4th century BC, the Greeks were colonising and they were growing those grapes around Marseille. Then they slowly travelled up towards the north of the Rhone. And by about the 1st century AD, uh, we had grape growing viticulture and winemaking up there as well. Um, fall of the Roman Empire, bad for wine in the, in the Rhone um, region so generally uh sort of slowed but what we do have that's really interesting in the Rhone and I love because it's such a, a rich part of the tapestry and the story there is uh Chateau Neuf de Pape which means new home of the Pope uh is so called because the um the Pope was moved from Rome to um Avignon big town in the region of the Rhone um and that was around the 14th century and as huge wine lovers, uh, the papacy, uh, yeah, lo love a bit of vino. So they actually planted extensively around the region again, and they really rebirthed the winemaking culture of the Rhone Valley. So we have a lot to thank them for. Um, in terms of climate, and again, this is important, and particularly when we go into grape varieties, um, very, very important. Um, but generally, it's cooler in the north, and I say cooler with um, an enormous pinch of salt, actually. It is a Mediterranean climate. It's just that in the, in the north, it's more moderate, and in the south, it's much, much warmer. Um, it's hot, 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 I tell you now. Uh, we were there, um, must be three years ago now, when there was a heat wave um, and the hottest ever recorded temperature was in, I think it was Carpentras, which is about 20 minutes from where my parents live in the Southern Rhone. And uh, it was 47 degrees, 46 degrees. Um, it was absolutely boiling. Now that's not quite as, as common, um, but very, very regularly throughout the summer months, that Southern Rhone is getting mid thirties, late thirties. So it's hot in the south and a little cooler in the north. But the thing both of them share in the north and the south, and this is really important, is um, the Mistral. Now, um, anyone that follows me on Instagram may have recently seen a story on uh, that I took because a lot of people do not believe the intensity of the Mistral. It's a wind that 
blows, um, I believe it's a suction wind rather, yes. Uh, and it's being sucked through that valley we spoke about earlier. And they say people can go mad. And I think my mum's bordering on going mad about, <laughs> from, from the Mistral. Um, but it's such an intense wind. And uh, it's the sort of wind that I've opened car doors before and not been able to shut them because it's blowing blowing so hard. And that really, really does affect grape growing. Um, it's w- positive in many ways. Um, often there's not much rot in the Rhone because when it does rain, the wind just blows it out straight away um, and blows off that sort of damp, soggy, soggy water off the grapes. And that didn't actually happen much this year during harvest time. So there was more rot than normal. But that's a very positive thing. It acts like a bit of an, an air freshener, if you would want to refer to it like that. Um, But it does mean that lots of the grapes can be damaged or they need to be grown in different ways. So it's a really unique um, environment to grow grapes, both in the north and in the south there. And it's one of the things, if people are talking about the Rhone, they will mention the Mistral. Um, Now, I'm going to get up some statistics. Um, Oh, well, just indulge me for a moment. But this was me four or five weeks ago um and I think that looks like Grenache yeah that's Grenache um so this is me working with some Grenache in a Cote de Rome village Appellation and I'll talk about what that means in a moment um I clearly stood and stopped looking for a moment to take the picture because I'm supposed to be sorting the grapes whereas they all look to be sort of on my hands um but I've had a lovely time out there so I'm really thrilled I have to say to be talking to you this evening about the Rome Valley because yes it's been a really really pleasant uh, few weeks there. So here's a quick map to say exactly where we're talking about. This is the section I've mentioned about the north and down here the south. You can actually see that there's a gap between the two and a lot of people do say that the Rhone would be better um, explained in two different regions. So you will often find people say this has a northern Rhone, um, if particularly when they're talking about the great variety Syrah, they'll say this has a very northern Rhone nose. And they really do mean northern Rhone. Um, there's a massive distinction between the two sections, which I think is probably why I'm going to really struggle to get it in 45 minutes. But we're going to try. <laughs> but I'm going to talk in some generalizations just to start with. So let's have a quick look at some top statistics about the Rhone. Um, these are generalizations, so it's not absolutely perfect. So it will be an average of a few years rather than last year, because it's quite hard to get really up to date data. Um, however, 3 million hectolitres are produced in the Rhone each year, so about 100 Olympic swimming pools. Um, it's the second largest Appalachian region in France, um, and that's second only after Bordeaux. In terms of what they're making, um, 75% red wine, 15% rosé, which might surprise some of you that there's more rosé than red, um, but it makes fantastic rosé, the region, and particularly in the south, southern part, and then 10% white. Um, I should also mention that they do also produce, this is a still wine statistic, but we are going to mention briefly, but we definitely will have to do a um, sip size on it. They produce some wonderful Vin du Naturel, so a um, sweet fortified wine. Um, so uh, Muscat de Bombe de Venise would be a lovely example. Um, and they make a Rasto Red, for example. And they also make a sparkling wine called Claret de D, uh, which we don't sell. Um, it's... N- <laughs> I will be honest, it's not one of the best um, sparkling wines of France, but it's certainly quite interesting. Um, and it is a claret grape variety that I adore, made in method ancestral. So made in the, tra- uh, sorry, made in method tradition now, the traditional method sparkling wine. Um, but generally it's quite warm down here um, to be making sparkling wine. So it's not its calling card. You can see here, calling card of the Rhone Valley is red wine, but I would argue rosé and um, whites are, can be as good a quality, they're just not being grown in the same volumes. Um, 67,628 hectares of vines, which is the equivalent of 68,000 rugby stadiums. Um, And there are 31 appellations. So um, for those of you less familiar with that word, it is a French term and it describes, the, the easiest way to think of it is you grow, you produce cheddar cheese in cheddar. Um, And actually the Appalachian system 
was uh, invented in the Rhone Valley by um, somebody in Chateauneuf de Pape. So this idea of protecting a region and designating the type of wine or cheese or whatever it might be that they produce based on that area and what their terroir is, so what their speciality is due to the soil, the aspect, the sun, the weather, the people, all of those things that come together to make a place special is actually was invented uh, by a gentleman, uh, Baron Leroy in chateauneuf de Pape. So this uh, this idea of, of protecting areas is very special in the Rhone, and there are 31 of those areas. And last but not least, and this is really quite interesting about the Rhone, there are 34 permitted grape varieties, not all over the Rhone, and we'll go into where what's allowed where. Each Appellation has its own rules, and um, there will be certain grapes that are allowed in certain Appellation. But to put it in perspective, in Burgundy, it's not quite true. There are more than two. There are a few, uh, Aligote, for example, or, or Gamay. But the two main grape varieties that almost all Burgundy is produced from are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And here in the Rhone, we have 34. So it's a real um, smorgasbord of grape varieties to choose from, depending on which appellation you're, you're in. So without further ado, let's talk about some grapes. Um, whilst we're talking about grapes, because I'm conscious it's been 13 whole minutes, and if anybody is like me, they're going to be wanting a little drink on a Tuesday, a little tipple. Um, I am going to taste the, uh, in order that I mentioned on the email, which is the Von Tu first, if you're tasting along with me. Um, don't worry, I will show you these bottles properly. But the Von Tu is first, followed by the Cote de Rhone, and then the Croisette Matage. Um, if you would like to have a little sip of any of them, please do, or anything that you've got. But if also, if you are tasting along and wanting to, I would suggest sip along with the Vontu now. Um, and if you want to know, it's a blend of Grenache, Syrah and Sanso, that one on the bottom of the screen. So as I talk about them, you can um, learn a little bit more about those great varieties. Anybody that was here last week will know that, was it last week? No, that was Cabernet the week before. Uh, well, no, I'm a big fan of Syrah. Um, and if you want to learn more on Syrah and you weren't here, don't worry, there's a YouTube on it. But I haven't done one on Grenache yet. And believe me, I will. Um, because Grenache is such a wonderful grape variety. Um, a lot of people used to say Syrah was perhaps the, the more serious. Um, and there's there's certainly an argument for that. It definitely provides a good amount of structure to um, Rhone wines. Um, but Grenache is very, very popular in the southern part of the Rhone. And because the south produces more wine, Grenache is actually by far the most planted grape variety in the Rhone. So it's worth remembering that. Although Syrah is probably more, I don't know, famous is probably not the right word to say, but um, Syrah is maybe more recognisable, respected. It's actually Grenache that was historically considered a bit of a workhorse, but actually makes incredible quality wine. Um, Emma Briffett, my team member, calls it the cookie monster cuddle. It's a really, really lovely, friendly, can be easy drinking, can be quite serious wine. They're um, the most famous Grenache in the world, if you want to, to consider a region that grows the most of it, is Chateauneuf de Pape. More often than not, Chateauneuf will be predominantly Grenache in the blend. Um, Priorat in Spain is also a very famous place for Grenache, where they call it Garnacha. Um, but the reason it's so good in the southern part is that it's a water-seeking bush vine. And that's great for two reasons. I mentioned that it was hot down there, water seeking, great, not a lot of rain in the summer. And then bush vine, they grow in these lovely bushes, which means that they're protected from that mistral wind. So Grenache is the perfect candidate to produce really, really good quality, but also lots of quantity in terms of um, grapes of the Southern Rome. What does it taste like? So what could you be picking up in your Vontu or what does it smell like? Well, uh, it's often very rich, often red fruits and some black fruits and spicy. Everyone always says, oh, Syrah is the black pepper. But Grenache is peppery too. Um, often I find white pepper 
But I don't know whether that's because I'm being led by other people who've told me that before. Um, I don't know the science behind it. When can you taste it, Angela? You can taste it now. Um, taste along whilst I'm talking. I'm going to go into this wine in just a moment properly and tell you about how it's made, who it's made by, etc. But please taste along. This is Grenache dominant. So whilst I'm talking about that lovely cookie monster, definitely, definitely taste along. The other grape in here is Syrah, or the other, the secondary grape. Um, I won't go into Syrah too much, but as I've already mentioned, black pepper is a big, a big uh, factor. Dark fruits generally got a beautiful color to it. And then also um, can sometimes be floral and violet, and particularly in the Rhone and the Northern Rhone, a lovely olive and tapenade thing. Worth mentioning, it doesn't like the heat as much as Grenache. So do we expect it to be down the south or in the north? It's in the north. And it's actually the only red variety permitted in the uh, cruise uh, of the north. So you can you can grow Grenache, but in the cruise, in the top parts of the northern Rhone, you are only allowed to grow Syrah as a red grape to produce your wines. I uh, will show you a few of those in a moment. Um, Muverdre, my mum is convinced that she can smell Muverdre in wines that don't have Muverdre in it. But because uh, she was once told that, and this is quite right, but she she was once told that Muverdre is, can be quite gamey and meaty. And it can. The other varieties can do that too when they get old. But Muverdre tends to show it when it's young. There's no Muverdre in the Vontu if you're tasting it. So um, if you are getting anything like that, that will be a bit more from age than it would from the grape variety. But the other good thing about me, Verdra, is it loves the sunshine. So we get a great, another grape that adores the sun. So as global warming and the temperatures are rising, me, Verdra is on the up. You are seeing it more and more and more. And the more producers I speak to, there's more of them planting me, Verdra, to try and deal with that. Um, Carignan, um, again, it's another really good heat withstanding variety. So we're definitely seeing more Carignan. Um, I should mention that Mouverdre and Carignan and Grenache, those, those three in particular, are really popular in Spain. So where it's even warmer, they have Spanish names. So Carignana, Movad, Movad, no, I can't do the Spanish pronunciation. Um, Motaro, there we go, got there in the end. Um, but those varieties are really good with the sun. So they're really important in this region. And then last but not least, Sanso. And I've included Sanso, it's in this wine. It tends to add quite a lot of freshness and it's really popular for rosés. Um, it's, it, it kind of adds this kind of lifted, fresh, um, not easy drinking, that's the wrong way to describe it, but certainly where the others can get quite hot and quite alcoholic, Sanso can sometimes just make it a little bit more lifted and light. Now, we haven't got any white wines, but I'm desperate to talk about these white wines and uh, these white grapes, sorry. And then I promise we'll go on to actually talking about where this wine's from. Um, I'll whistle through them, um, but hopefully some of you will have tried them before. So we've got Viognier. Um, in the north in particular, Viognier can make some beautiful single varietal wines and can be blended in with that Syrah in the north. Um, it's less common than, than perhaps textbooks and, and, and um, stats would say, but you're allowed to blend certain amounts of Viognier into some Appalachian in the north, um, but in practice, perhaps not done so much. Uh, the most famous 100% um, Viognier from the north is probably Condru, which I hope some of you have tried and many of you may have done. Um, annoyingly, I really wanted to use one, but they're just too expensive. Um, we'll do white wines of the Rhone and then we'll throw one in. They are delicious. Um, there's yellow fruit, sort of like a yellow plums sometimes. Um, can be very floral, very aromatic, sometimes a nice spice to it. Um, they don't tend to be the most acidic wines, so they're very food friendly for people who don't want too much acid as well. Um, so highly, highly recommend uh, Viognier's from the Rhone. Grenache Blanc, that is the white version of Grenache and that likes the sun, surprise, surprise. So we're going to see more of it in the south. We don't see it in the north. It's that sun worshipper. It's actually not really allowed in the north um, or certainly not in the in the crew, those important Appalachians. It tends to be quite full bodied, rich. It's got this lingering finish. Um, and often you'll find it as quite a substantial 
part of the blend in a Cote de Rhone uh, white wine. Marsan and Roussan, they often come as a pair. Um, not always, but they do. Um, Marsan tends to be sort of powerful. It can age really well. It can be quite floral. Um, it's found in the north and the south. Um, in the north, again, it can be blended. In the south, it, it can be blended as well. Quite nutty. Um, so very, very powerful wines. Roussan um, is perhaps more complex um but it's it's more it's less nutty and more um for me floral so honeysuckle those sorts of things uh, and i have to say we um my family and i had a beautiful roussan dominant aged wine um it wasn't too aged but a, a lightly aged wine um whilst i was over there and oh my goodness it was just this sort of honeyed yeah, very, very honeyed, beautiful uh, flavour. So Marsan and Roussan are really fun blending components. Um, we've had a question from Rich and Georgie that I will cover quickly now because I think it's worth saying. I've just put here some of the top great varieties of the Rhone. There are, as I mentioned, many more. There are even 13 uh, varieties allowed in Chateau Neuf de Pape. Now they've asked, are there any other grapes that have a red and white version as per Grenache? You often hear two numbers when you're told about how many grape varieties are allowed in Chateau Neuf de Pape. Some people say 13 and some people say 18. And the reason is there are 13 varieties, but there are 18 color variants in total. So examples are in the, in the Chateau Neuf de Pape example, Grenache Blanc, white Grenache, Grenache Gris, gray Grenache, Grenache Rouge, so three Grenaches, uh, Picpoul Noir. So if you've ever had a Picpoul de Pinay, did you know that it has a has a red variant? So a Picpoul Noir and a Picpoul Blanc. Um, there are plenty of these examples and they're mutations. So um, they're more common than you think, but actually in the Rhone, they really utilize them. So they do use these different color variations. And um, so, yes, 13, there's five color variations that add to the Chateau Neuf de Pape color palette should we say um so yes the answer is very much so um and if you're interested i'll send when i send the follow-up email to this event i will send you some links uh, particularly uh, the the roan wine body has some great resources so i'll send you a link to that because they're quite interesting to see all of the different great varieties i mean it's mental but it's 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 fun wild so one last thing to cover, and I have to cover it because it is important. Um, the and then we will properly go on to the wines. But there are there is a um, quite simple and quite lovely quality hierarchy in the Rhone. I'll throw out one thing first that isn't covered, and I hope I put the map here after it. Yes, I did. Good. Not completely silly. Um, there's one one thing that's not covered in the quality hierarchy and it sort of sits outside it. And Vontu is part of that. Vontu is actually here in this blue area and um, it doesn't sit as easily and quite as neatly into the Appalachian um, quality hierarchy that I'm about to go through. Um, it's sort of, if you imagine, sits he sort of here all the way above because you get amazing ones, you get less good ones and then you get things that completely disobey all the rules so Vontu um you can't call it Vontu necessarily um AOC but you can get Merlot and Chardonnay and all sorts of things growing up there so um there are a few places that sort of are a bit maverick um and sit outside it but by and large they do um fall into this triangle and I think it's quite helpful to to see it visually Cote de Rhone is the, um, I hate entry level, someone needs to come up with something better, starting point. It's the, the gateway to the Rhone, let's call it. Um, and that is, uh, they're usually from the south. It's easier to produce grapes in the southern part of the Rhone. You'll see why when we get to the final one. But it's easier to produce grapes. They reach full ripeness, lovely, lovely. So if you're producing a wine at around the £10 mark, your Cote de Rhone wines are probably, or, or under, you know, we all know that you can get great Cote de Rhone for six pounds. Those wines are going to be probably in the south. There's a few places in the north you're allowed to make it, but majority south. And uh, they tend to be Grenache based because Grenache likes the south. Um, and they tend to be um, 
easier drinking, perhaps they've not seen any oak, that some can. Um, so you do have a spectrum, but as a, as a general rule, these wines are, are not the wines that sing of what they say is this terroir, this place. It's sort of like a regional wine. One up is your Cote de Rome village. And there are 95 villages at the moment. And um, those, those Cote de Rome villages don't have the name after them. So if you have a bottle of wine that just says Cote de Rome Village, it's from one of these 95 places, but it's not deemed special enough to then be able to write the label on. So it's better than a Cote de Rome, they say, and often things might be, it can produce better alcohol content or um, it has better sense of place. So it's better than your standard Cote de Rome, might cost you one or two pounds more, maybe one, and that, that bumps you up a level. We then bump up another level and we have these 22 um, actual villages, but then they have the name. So where I've just been working is a village called Segare and it's Cote de Rhone Village Segare. So you can kind of see what's happening here is the more stuff gets added onto the end of Cote de Rhone, the higher up the quality tree you're going. So um, Cote de Rhone standard, Cote de Rhone Village, Cote de Rhone Village Segare, Cote de Rhone Village Vizan, um, Cote de Rhone Village Plan de Dieu. Um, so if you see that on the label, that is an indication that there is a sense of place, but it's just not been uh, promoted to the top, top, top. Now, top secret. Um, actually, we won't go into that. We'll go into that next week. <laughs> but it's it's. Um, it, it means there's still a sense of place, but it's not deemed in this special category of crew. Now, the final bit is that these crew wines don't say Cote de Rhone on them anywhere. They are deemed so good that you don't even have to mention they're from the Rhone. It's quite frustrating because it means that if you don't know them, you might not be able to recognize them. But our final wine this evening is the most approachable crew of the Northern Rhone. And you can see on the front of the label for anyone that has it, there is not a mention of the Rhone anywhere. It is just quasi metage, and you're expected to know that that is one of the crew from the Northern Rhone. So um, they do like to trick you, the French, the French appellation systems, they're mean, but uh, that is just something you learn, but it's something you explore and it's gorgeous and fun. And that's why we love wine. So let's drink some wine or taste some wine, I should say. Um, for those of you who uh, have the Vontu, as I've mentioned, it's from this blue area here. That's actually basically Mon Vontu just there. Um, it is, and I should have a picture. Let me just check. Here we go. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, cyclist's dream. Uh, if you're looking at the top there, that is not uh, snow. It's a huge sort of chalky outcrop right on the top. It is 1,900 meters high. Um, I've already mentioned that red, it's sort of the order is red, white, rose, uh, sorry, red, rose, white in these Southern Rhone appellations. But I should say that rose is particular, particularly popular here. The reason is, and you might be able to taste it in wine number one, there's a lot of freshness. A lot of the vines grown around the Rhone are, uh, sorry, grown around bon two, Mont bon two have got elevation, so they're slightly cooler. And so this particular wine, you might find there's some quite high acidity. Um, it's, I'm gonna have a quick taste now, but it should be a little sharper than the next wine we're about to taste. And that's because it's on this elevation. So let's have a quick taste. I've just seen the message, Lila, about when will we be discussing the three wines? The answer is now. <laughs> the rest of the session is going to be exclusively about these three wines and where they're from. So fear not. Um, but yes, so I've had a bit of my Von Tu La Um, I'll show you the snap of it here. It's got that kind of like fruitiness, but it's so the fruits for me are quite tart fruits and that comes from a little bit of elevation so they're not jammy they're not overripe um this is classic to a von two it's um probably one of the regions that's going to be the most future proofed with global warming because it does have that elevation and i should mention that jancis robinson a few years ago when somebody asked her where would you buy um a vineyard if you could pick anywhere in the world and she picked mon von two so it's 
most interesting. Um, I mentioned earlier as well, for anyone who has been tasting along, it's Grenache Syrah Sanso. Uh, so it's got those red fruits, but it's got some black fruit as well. I actually find it quite herbaceous and particularly that's the lingering taste I'm getting. And I'm getting that from maybe the syrup, I think, because cool climate syrup can give you this sort of green herbaceous notes. And I'm really enjoying that. Um, I saw somebody mention earlier on the chat, and I apologize because it sort of zooms past, but somebody mentioned that it wasn't a, a sort of most particularly exciting uh, style of wine. It's not supposed to be a, the reason I've included it is it's not your classic hug in a glass coat de Rhone. This is sort of the region that the Rhone is going in. Um, because it's definitely, um, this is an area to watch in the future. This is an area that we should be looking towards to make the future stars of wine from the Rhone. And we need to change how we make wine in the Rhone because we can't keep getting 15, 16% wines. It's it's unsustainable. And what the, the Mont Ventoux can do is reduce that alcohol because it's got the elevation. This particular wine, um, Paul Jaboulayani, you may recognize the name, uh, once owned by the Jaboulay family. It's now owned by a family called The Phrase. And Caroline uh, is a fantastic winemaker, the daughter who produces this wine. Um, the slopes are south-facing and those south-facing slopes do get extra sunshine and long days, but that elevation keeps the acidity high. So I think the, this and the next wine will probably be the most interesting comparison because they're not from too far geographically away from each other, but they will taste incredibly different. So if you do have the second wine, the Escaravai, I very actively encourage you to have a look at it now. Um, have a smell of it. Very, very different on the nose for me, um, that particular wine. Um, I'll just take this down so that we can... We can taste some wines together. Um, but yes, what I would say is the Vontu, much more sort of, um, I don't want to say dark and moody because it's not, but it's definitely got that tartar fruit. And then if you go onto the Escaravai, and I'll just quickly show you the bottle. Escaravai meaning beetle, um, the sablier here. Uh, it's the type of little beetle. Um, it's a Grenache and Syrah blend. So there's no Sanso in this, but relatively similar in terms of, of the blend, you know, we're talking two out of, the Sanso would be a touch in the Vontu. So we're talking the main two grape varieties are the same. But I can smell far more, um, far more sort of that Christmassy smell, silly thing to say, but red fruits, um, almost a kind of spice, cinnamon, those sorts of flavors. Um, I've apparently been asked for the alcohol level on both wines. Um, the alcohol on the Bontu is 14 and a half. Um, if it had been on the valley floor, we'd be looking at 15 and a half, I think, for that. 2019 was a very hot vintage. And the 2018 is 14. And again, a really warm vintage. Um, we're drinking three warm vintages, I should say, of the Southern Rhone. So, um, yeah, 2021 might not be so hot, just as a word of warning, having seen it was a, a strange summer. But yeah, we are drinking three hot vintages. But Going back to the Escaravai. Mm. You might see if you're tasting along what I mean about the um, that fruit being more plush, more, I don't want to say cooked at all, it's not cooked, but it's more like a, a strawberry that's been in the punnet for a few days. Whereas that first wine was much more tart and it was more brambles and um picking sort of fruit straight from the tree um whereas this does feel a bit more like a kind of fruit that that is how brits like to eat them which is juicy and ripe and um, so it does feel slightly different um, where this is from do, 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 do. let me just pop it back up quickly to show you oh hopefully you can see that where this particular wine is from it is a Cote de Rhone. And what that means is it's a sort of generic regional. It will probably have broken some of the rules of the place where the winemaker is based. And the winemaker, so I'm just trying to grab my cursor. The winemaker is based here in Rasto, this little pink circle here. And they do have uh, vines in Rasto, Roex, uh, the Plan de Jour. 
Um, but this is their coat to own. And there could be several reasons why it's a coat to own, but more often than not, one of the reasons is they'll be using vineyards that haven't been um, put into that little bubble, but they're still using really good winemaking techniques from crew vineyards. So it's for me, a really good value Cote de Rhone because you've got top, top winemaking. It's just that your vines might be, I don't know, two kilometers away from the absolute top ones. They could be 200 meters from the top ones. Um, but generally Cote de Rhone wines will be Grenache based. I've already mentioned that. They will also be from this wider section of the Southern Rhone. You can find there's a few Cote de Rhone bits here. You can see the little green dots perhaps. Yes, you can get Cote de Rhone from up there, but it's far less common. If you imagine you can find Cote de Rhone all in this Southern part. Um, it was formalized as an Appalachian in 1937. And if I say that the Appalachian system was only invented in 36, it was a definitely an earlier, um, an earlier sign up. Um, it makes 85% red, so majority red, and then 8% um, rosé and the rest white. So it's more heavily swung on just the reds. You do get Cote de Rome whites, but generally, as a rule, the reds tend to do better. And then this particular wine, so please do taste along. I've included a couple of photos I took last week as I was there. Um, this is the road up to the vineyard, uh, well, up to the winery, I should say, which is absolutely gorgeous. And you can see the sort of rolling hills. Um, and then just because I love dogs. Um, and this is the young winemaker, Madeline. Madeline sorry. Um, her, her, she works with her father, Gilles. Um, and they're very, very hospitable. So if you do get a chance to visit the, uh, the Southern Rhone in the near future, I cannot recommend Escaravai enough. One of the most beautiful tasting rooms in the Southern Rhone and the most special spot. Um, and this is their dog, Pia. And because I have a whippet, we often take my whippet and they play together. Um, but it's a beautiful spot. And yes, if you need if you need their details and visiting times, please shout because I, I couldn't recommend them highly enough. But this wine in particular, Grenache based, as I've said, with some Syrah, it's made in concrete, so it's not aged in oak and it's meaty. It's earthy. Um, there's no Miverda in there, so my mum would not be getting the meat from that. But it's three years old and it's started to sort of evolve and show its true colours. It's a really beautifully aged wine. I can't see where what Marcel has put the drink date for, but I will let you know, um, because I think you could still see a couple more years on this. But. It's definitely a generous Cote de Rhone, in my opinion. So, mm. I do hope some of you bought it, and I hope not too many of you buy it afterwards because I think I'm going to have to buy a few more bottles of that as well. <laughs> so, I'll fight you for it. Um, but it's definitely more red fruits. It's definitely sort of a friendly, um, a friendly Cote de Rhone, but definitely not. Um, you know, not a cheap and cheerful. There's a lot going on there. There's herbs, there's spices, red fruits, like I've mentioned. Maybe a tiny touch of something slightly licorice-y, um, which I love, but not, um, yeah, not overly powering. Overly powering? Overpowering. Um, and now let's go on to the third wine, which is our, um, oh, I nearly got those bundled up. It's our third wine of the evening. And I was toying about which way around to do this, but I thought it made sense to work up our pyramid. And we're coming here into the top of the pyramid. And what this map is that um, it's, it's cut out the bottom section. So it's just the northern Rhone. And um, it's giving you the, those crew, that top part of the triangle. So it's really pinpointing those for you. And this particular wine is from number six, which is Croise Hermitage. Um, Hermitage itself is this tiny little number five here and Coeur's Hermitage is almost like the extension around it. It's on the other side of the hill. It's slightly different soil types, um, but a lot of people say that Coeur's Hermitage, and I would agree, is um, not only probably the most approachable of the Northern Rhone crew, but also probably the best value for money and definitely one that we could show at an event like this. And, and it's an easier drinker. Um, they're elegant, but easy drinking. And I think for a lot of the other northern crews of the Rhone, they are robust and they are dark and they are hearty, um, sometimes bordering on not astringent, that's the wrong word, but 
and um, piercing. And this this isn't like that, but you are, um, there are certainly, and Hermitage wines, not Croix Hermitage, but Hermitage wines, that tiny little spot, they will age forever and you want to drink them older and you want them to develop into these sort of mushroomy, olivey things. And the Croix Hermitage is lovely because it's contra- it can be drunk younger. You can enjoy it quicker. And you might find um, that you prefer one or the other, but what you'll probably find more often than not is if you like a producer, they might have Croix Hermitage vines get the money coming in quicker and then they'll have Hermitage vines as well and say so they'll almost have two different styles they sound very similar but they are wildly different so do be um yeah do be aware of that um it's worth saying as well that it's uh, I think it's the largest commune San Joseph gives it a run for its money but the way San Joseph on the left is divided up is slightly strange because it does share some bits with Convru. Um, I believe on landmass, Croix Hermitage is the largest. Um, the reds, as we discussed at the beginning, exclusively from Syrah. And this is not one of the Appalachian um, where you would add uh, your Viognier in. Those would, um, yeah, that's that's not going to fly here. Um, you Actually, you can add a bit, but nobody does. I suppose that's the point to make. Um, you're more likely to get it up in Cote Roti, for example, where you get something like 20%. Um, down in Hermitage, you wouldn't add Viognier, you'd add Marsan and Roussan. Um, and nobody does that quite so much. So that sort of classic Syrah Viognier blend we spoke about at the beginning is up north in Cote Roti, which is number one. Uh, I should also mention that Cote Roti, I mentioned it in the Syrah session, very pricey, and Hermitage, very pricey. Um, and they are the red wines. You've then got, uh, just whilst we're here, <clears throat> some white wines, very famous white wines from Condru, 100% Viognier, also very expensive. And inside Condru, they've actually missed it here, but there's another crew called Chateau Guillot. Uh, it's actually a crew and only one producer. It's very unique. And that's a Viognier one as well. And so you sort of have the Viognier land in the north, and then it becomes, that's very bad way of explaining it, but it becomes more Marsan Roussan territory down here in the south. And then Saint Joseph is Marsan Roussan too. So this is 100% Viognier. Uh, sorry, it's definitely not. I've only had a few sips. Uh, this is 100% Syrah. There is no Viognier and there is no Marsan Roussan. So if it's a Quasimitage, you wouldn't have put Viognier in anyway, but uh, it's 100% Syrah. Um, and it is a producer called Domaine Pochon. And it's a gentleman called Etienne who only started producing wine. I think his first vintage was 2014. And he used to go to the local co-op. Um, and I will explain now why it's expensive to grow wines in the Southern Rhone. Uh, Northern Rhone, sorry, I'm getting such a muddle. Um, you have these amazing banks. Now, Croissant Mitage, I mentioned earlier, is a bit more sloping hills. Um, but you do have this amazing sort of... Um, hillside way of growing wine here. Um, he used to sell his wine to the co-op and then he made the commitment to start making his own wine. And it's quite a commitment to do in the, in the Northern Rhone. And I'm so glad he has because he has gone from strength to strength. Um, organic vineyards, which is fabulous. Uh, he ages them partly in oak foudres and then partly in tanks. So he does soften that syrup slightly. But by and large, it's just a beautiful, pure expression of a Northern Rhone Syrah. So have a little taste. And I'm going to check on questions because I'm conscious of time. I have been answering as we go, but just in case, have a taste. Hopefully you'll smell more black fruits on this one more than the red. You might find that the acidity, the mouth-watering sensation is also a bit higher. Again, we're in a cooler climate, but we're also using no Grenache. And so we're exclusively Syrah. Mm. and it's this sort of beautiful oh it has got a bit of that black olivey thing I get a bit of black tea in this as well sort of um I don't want to say earl grey that's wrong but I'm almost bordering on it there's almost a bergamot um that sort of aromatic floral thing um but lots more red fruits than the previous two wines. Um, sorry, lots more black fruits than the previous two wines, which were a lot more strawberry-esque. This for me is now black currants, real black currants, real blueberries, blackberries, all of those sorts of things. 
um, and Woody. I think that's a that's a fair point to say. Um, you shouldn't really be able to taste the oak in a food drawer, and you can't really, but um, it's definitely a little bit more woody, and you get those lovely tannins on the tongue. Um, very polished, and I think incredible value for money. I'll just get the price up here. Um, the value for money here for me is is staggering actually for 14 pounds 50 you're getting a top top quality syrup um i hope he doesn't put his his prices up fingers crossed because for me this is a great um friday night wine top quality for a really good price i can already see yeah tracy saying the quasi quasi metage is delicious yeah i think so too um i think in terms of the quality for me wines two and three are probably pretty decent match actually but i think that then comes down to personal preference when I tried the Coaz Hermitage earlier, before I'd emailed you to say, let them sit for 30 minutes at least, or, or open them before if you can and pour them before, um, I tried it without, uh, you know, I tried it straight out of the bottle and I thought it was very closed and I had to come back to it, um, which was why actually the email was a bit delayed because I thought, I'm not sure, I'm not sure on the order, maybe this could go earlier. And actually the more, it's, the more it came out in the glass, it really showed itself. And was far more expressive. So um, it's one of those wines that, that the final glass will be the best one. Um, but I do hope that you have it. Right, I'm going to whistle through two questions and it'll take us hopefully to 10, 10 to. Um, apologies, I told you I'd go over again. When will I learn? Um, uh, Robbie said, is it fair to say that Grenache is less well adopted in the warmer New World regions? And if so, why do you think that is? Um, I would say it isn't. Um, it's just not been as fashionable. So traditionally, Syrah was seen as this sort of um, powerful, elegant, stylish wine. And Grenache was seen as the thing that made Cote de Rhone go a bit further. Um, that's a real generalisation. That's very cruel. I'm just going to stop a share. Um, but you now find Grenache grown in New World countries to an exceptionally high level. And the two countries I would really watch out for are um South Africa, they're producing beautiful 100% Grenache. Um, they also produce GSM blends, so Grenache, Syrah, Mie Verdre, um, but they do really well. And Australia, and Australia's Grenache is absolutely fantastic. And those two countries in particular is where I would, where I'd put my money and watch out for. Um, what you find is people perhaps take, have historically taken Grenache le a bit less seriously, but my argument is, and this is a personal argument, it's not, um, factual I suppose is the wrong way to describe it but um Pinot Noir is going to struggle with global warming Grenache shares a lot of properties with Pinot Noir and if you treat Grenache in the right way um and you don't get it too ripe bush vines are good for that they they stop quite a lot of um phenolic ripe or slow phenolic ripening so then you're not getting these 15 percent alcohols if you treat Grenache correctly and people are learning how to do that it's got a lot in common with the Pinot Noir in terms of flavour and um, I think it will therefore people will start to realise that good Grenache is absolutely world class um, so it's not to be sniffed at but I totally get your point Shiraz Syrah sort of spread all over the world and Grenache didn't quite do the same thing I think that's changing I think that really really is changing so keep your eyes peeled and um, particularly on Joe Lock MW's South African ones and Freddie Bulmer's um, Australian ones Although it's grown everywhere, there's some beautiful stuff in Paso and um, USA and all sorts. But um, do, 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 do. let me have a quick look. Uh, John Williams, all the vineyards in the northern Rhone except Coz are on the other, well, the west side of the Rhone. Can you explain why? Um, I would suggest um, it's not so much, and I will try and quickly get the map back up. It's a little bit less about them being on the side of the Rhone and more about needing extra bits of sunshine. <clears throat> Pardon me. If you think about up here, number one, Cote Roti, that actually translates as roasted slope. And the reason is it's actually south facing. And so it's probably, I mean, don't get me wrong, the ge geological formations do come into play to an extent, but then you have to consider that Hermitage is on this side of the river as well. And that is the other fantastic um, crew. But Hermitage also, slightly faces to the south now historically um 100 years ago 200 years ago that southern facing aspect got you those extra sunshine hours that were essential for ripening your syrup it wouldn't ripen properly otherwise um so those were really really important 
Likewise, you can see all these tributaries on this side of the river. You find a lot of the vineyards, those southern aspects facing down to the tributaries. So um, I would say it's actually probably the argument historically has been less about um, which side of the bank and more about which side of the, which aspect of the slope. And um, it, there were more aspects here. There are more aspects here. And that beautiful coat road here as well. So, yeah, that's not the best answer, John. I apologise, but that would be quite a generic, but um, hopefully relatively informative answer. Um, but, yeah, just remember that Hermitage, the, arguably the most expensive um, the most expensive crew, probably more so than Chateauneuf de Pape, even uh, is on that bank. So, um, and last but not least, um, tonight we've been enjoying 2018 vintage. Do you have any comments about what to expect from a cooler 2021? Um, oh, interesting question. Really interesting question. I would say uh, the alcohol levels are going to be lower, and I think a lot of people might appreciate that. Um, there are certain grape varieties. Uh, it depends where you are. I'm really generalizing here. And um, the Northern Rhone, I think, probably um, picked. Um, well, no, it, it's hard to say. Different Appalachian and different regions are going to have really specific um, nuances this year. But one thing will definitely be um, low alcohol. Tends to be as well that more sort of herbaceous and spicy note rather than the fruit forward character. So you might find that. Um, I think a lot of people were quite relieved to have a slightly cooler 2021. However, I mentioned earlier things like the Mistral not blowing during picking in the Southern Rhone. There were lots of things uh, that affected the harvest and actually, therefore, um, we might see that a lot of grapes had to be got rid of because of rot and things like that. So it will be lower alcohol, slightly different flavour profile on the more herbaceous thing, and then actually lower volumes. So fingers crossed that doesn't translate into too much of a price hike, um, but certainly there's going to be less wine produced in the rain this year than there historically has been. But that's less to do with the coolness and more to do with a slightly dodgy uh, vintage in general with frosts, bad frosts, um, but also some rot at the end. So I think I have to finish there. I'm sorry, I've even gone over my extended going over time. I've got no self-control. I do apologise. Um, but thank you again so much for joining um, Mahesh and I this evening. We, oh, I'm glad Julia likes my gateway rather than uh, entry level. Yeah, I think I'll use that again, Julia. Um, but I do hope you enjoyed at least one of the wines this evening. I spotted a few of you drinking some other lovely uh, Rhone wines. I cannot recommend drinking Rhone enough. Uh, there is a wine for every occasion. I'm just gutted that I only had three and I wanted to talk about three different regions. Uh, we will do more on white Rhone. We'll definitely do rosé. Um, it's my love and my passion. So you will not stop me waxing lyrical on the Rhone. So thank you for joining us. On that note, you can join us next week for the Southern Cruise. I'm going to deep dive into some things other than Chateauneuf de Pape. Um, but I do hope that you've got something hearty to enjoy for your supper this evening. I've made the terrible mistake of fish, um, which I don't think is really going to work too well. It's a white fish, so not great. But I've also got some French sausage on downstairs, so I'm going to go and enjoy that first. Um, please do let me know uh, what you thought of the wines over email if I send you an email tomorrow. And I will send you as much information as I possibly can that I didn't get to squeeze through. So thank you all very much and a cheers.